everyone. Welcome to today's broadcast, The Clinical Utility of 125, Dihydroxy Vitamin D. I am Christina Mahalik of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Diasorin. Diasorin Incorporated offers the broadest, fully automated infectious disease and specialty diagnostics menu, including best-in-class vitamin D. These quality assays are analyzed on the Versatile Liaison XL platform. With their excellent instruments and assays, Diasorin provides value through sales, service, and support solutions to clinical laboratories by consolidating their menu in order to streamline processes and increase efficiency. For more information, please visit diasorin.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll answer as many questions as time permits. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right hand corner of the window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button located at the top right of your presentation window or submit your problem through the green Q&A button located at the lower left of the window. This is an educational webinar and offers free continuing education credits for viewing. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process for obtaining your credits. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Gregory Plotnikoff. Dr. Gregory Plotnikoff is a board-certified internist and pediatrician who has received national and international honors for his work in cross-cultural and integrative medicine. Before opening Minnesota Personalized Medicine, Dr. Plotnikoff served as an integrative medicine physician at the Penny George Institute for Health and Healing and as a senior consultant at the Center for Healthcare Innovation, Ulina Healthcare in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Dr. Plotnikoff is a graduate of Carleton College, Harvard Divinity School, and the University of Minnesota Medical School. Dr. Plotnikoff is a frequent invited speaker and has been quoted in numerous national magazines, including the New York Times, Chicago Tribune, and Los Angeles Times. He has been heard on multiple radio programs, including All Things Considered, Speaking of Faith, and Science Friday. His 2003 article on vitamin D and chronic pain is one of the most highly cited, art, cited articles in the history of the Mayo Clinic proceedings. I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Plotnikoff for his presentation. Great. Well, thank you, Christina, and thank you, Arun, for joining us today. This is actually a very important topic on an uh, article of, of testing that isn't um, well understood often. So I want today to be um, uh, clinically meaningful, um, both uh, for clinicians as well as for people supporting clinicians in laboratory settings. Uh, this test to the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D is actually measurement of the actual sequel steroid that you see um, below you. A couple quick things that, to start out uh, first. Um, uh, so we'll advance the slides here. First, I work at Minnesota Personalized Medicine. I'm an active clinician with a uh, long uh, waiting list of persons uh, for persons who have been through a lot of medical evaluation and still don't have a diagnosis or have a diagnosis, but um, no treatment plan um, that's affecting positive change. It's a very unique practice, uh, tertiary, quaternary, I mean, fifth opinion type of uh, clinic. And I need to let you know, I'm not gonna discuss any off-label use or any investigational um, applications. And I do have one financial relationship to disclose. This Diasorin is uh, providing an honorarium for me to present this presentation for you today. 
So with that started, we're going to talk about vitamin D. And when we think about vitamin D, we think about sun exposure. We think about um, all the, uh, every photon touching our skin, um, breaking open the steroid and, and starting the vitamin D initiation process. But there's been a lot of concern about uh, vitamin D and there's um, a lot of debate as whether we should test for it, uh, whether we should supplement for it, whether it should even be outside in the sun every day. To quote the chairman of one world famous clinic, he said, every photon touching our skin is a potential carcinogen. Well, that might be overcalling it a bit, but I wanted to kind of start out by just kind of beautiful images around a topic that actually is deeply meaningful behind the scenes. So how are we going to do this? Uh, here's the flow for today's presentation. We're going to talk about case studies in hypercalcemia, hypocalcemia, normal calcemia, cases where it makes sense to test with a 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. And we're also going to talk about monitoring uh, treatments, including um, some additional um, nuances of where this test can be very, very helpful. We've got nine case studies to go through. Seven of them are for hypercalcemia. So let's start out with the very beginning. First, as you may recall, is that vitamin D is actually produced in our skin from the sun. We start out with a pre-vitamin pre D, 7-dehydrocholesterol, which then with uh, sun exposure and an ultraviolet B light of a certain strength can reach a certain level of our skin, pop open the, the second uh, ring, and um, you have production of cholecalciferol. This then goes uh, into uh, the liver um, where it can then be, go through its first activation, um, producing calcidiol. Um, excuse me, this, uh, yes, um, liver will produce calcidiol. And then it can go as, has been understood is that it goes to the kidney, the proximal tubule, one alpha hydroxylase will then produce the dihydroxy vitamin D, which is so important for calcium and phosphorus homeostasis. However, there's a lot more to the story. So the right-hand side of the screen here, you see uh, um, the nuances which are now coming forth. One is vitamin D receptors seem to be playing a significant role in health and well-being. Still being worked out, but polymorphisms, uh, SNPs, uh, in these, these variations uh, appear to uh, possibly play a role in health and disease. Second uh, concern are the SIP, the P450 enzymes, the 27A1, the 27B1, the 24A1, which is sometimes called the, the 2R1. These are all very important in how vitamin D is made and, and broken down. And then there's also a vitamin D binding protein. About 99% of vitamin D is actually bound. Only 1% is actually active. Variations in binding protein, variations in albumin, can affect uh, variations in uh, free vitamin D potentially. Not established, but these are hypotheses which are now being um, uh, examined. Key points, let's kind of start out with the key points. First, the 125 um, dihydroxy vitamin D is the activated form. This is what binds to the vitamin D receptor, which is part of the superfamily of nuclear receptors. And this is what makes vitamin D a hormone rather than a vitamin. Recall that vitamins and minerals are cofactors in enzymatic reactions. Vitamin D is actually a hormone. It actually uh, binds to receptor and affects gene expression. In fact, the gene expression of perhaps 2,000 key genes in our body, and certain genes are keenly important for mood, memory, energy, sleep, generalized oomph power. But uh, in particular, um, we know that there are vitamin D receptors throughout the brain, both cognitive and emotional parts. Every immune cell, every bone marrow cell, every skeletal muscle cell, these are all uh, covered with vitamin D receptors. Vitamin D is clearly playing a role uh, there in affecting genomic expression. So why not measure 125 dihydroxy vitamin D on everyone? Well, the point is, it's not the best measure for vitamin D. The measure for vitamin D status is the 25 
hydroxy vitamin D. And this is really a critical and critically important point. People on these electronic macro records accidentally press the wrong button and get the wrong result. That's not what they need. For vitamin D status, it's 25 hydroxy vitamin D. A 125 is not helpful for assessing vitamin D status. What we will see today and through nine plus case studies is where it is critical and critically important for, uh, for uh, diagnostic and therapeutic purposes. But for the vast majority of tests of vitamin D, um, where you want to actually know vitamin D status, you want to get the 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Now, the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D has a circulating half life that is relatively short. And there is a diurnal variation, like with many other hormones. And so, in fact, for any kind of research studies or any kind of consistency where there's repeated measures, you're going to want to have it done at about approximately the same time. Kind of a third uh, critical point is that the concentration of the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D is a thousand times less than that of the 25 hydroxy D. Wow, that means that testing for this has to be uh, exquisitely uh, sensitive and uh, to get accurate reproducible measures, you want to have a really good product. And notice that the reference range is between about 15 and 75 micrograms per ml as opposed to the 25 hydroxy D, which generally runs in nanograms per ml. Now, reviewing again where we're going uh, with this, is kind of the 7 dehydrocholesterol in the presence of ultraviolet B goes to pre-vitamin D, which then goes to cholecalciferol vitamin D3 or ergocalciferol vitamin D2. Now, this is really important because a lot of people ask, oh, I'm taking vitamin D, and most vitamin D in the stores is vitamin D3, cholecalciferol, which is ultraviolet B activated lanolin uh, from uh, sheep, um, from the sheep wool. Ergocalciferol, which is vitamin D2, is ultraviolet B activated and transformed ergocalciferol found in fungal. Uh, uh, cell walls, and uh, this is good, comes from mushrooms. So yes, sun-activated mushrooms will be a good source of vitamin D2, uh, which can be active, but with a much shorter half-life than vitamin D3. Now notice that vitamin D3, which is by oral means or by sun exposure means, has to go through a CYP2R1 to become calcidiol. That is what takes place in the liver. Calcidiol then would be a replenishment in liver failure, perhaps. Um, and then CYP27B1 will again create the activated form of vitamin D, the 125, also known as calcitriol. And note that there are a number of prescription drugs listed here, ergocalciferol, calcidiol, calcitriol. These are all available on, on prescriptions. All right, so in this, we will come back to this picture uh, again and again, but I just want to show you that the 125, which is at near the bottom middle of the circle, um, is a negative regulator of parathyroid hormone and a positive regulator of FGF23, the fibrinogen growth factor. These in turn have either positive or neg negative regulation effects in 27B1. Uh, and so therefore there is a lot of exquisite homeostatic uh, uh, monitoring and balancing of the system, including the kind of breakdown of uh, vitamin D. We'll come back to that because this, this will turn out to be important. Um, but just know that it's kind of homeostatic control of 125 dihydroxy vitamin D uh, means that, uh, that you shouldn't have a consistency at the same time of the day, day by day, uh, for measurement and activity. Okay, so what are some other clinical pearls that you need to know? Uh, well, one is that 
uh, and severe vitamin D deficiency, 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Uh, the 125 can go really low because there's just not enough stuff around for it to work on. Second thing is that the 125 can also be low or can be normal with severe, severely high levels of the 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And third is that you would expect the 125 levels to go low as you have more uh, severe degrees of renal impairment. That is the glomerular fil filtration rate drops, um, so will the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. And that's why it can be so important to measure on uh, people who are on renal dialysis or approaching dialysis. In fact, uh, calcitriol supplementation is now considered the standard of care in dialysis patients uh, because of its importance as a hormone operating throughout the body. Now, another thing is um, there have been a lot of people who've been measuring 125 dihydroxy vitamin D for a lot of different reasons outside of kind of established, uh, understood uh, frameworks of hypercalcemia and the like. And so it's important to recognize that actually you can get high levels potentially of 125 with low levels of the 25. And the reasoning is this, low 25 means low ionized calcium, low ionized calcium means increased parathyroid hormone to maintain calcium levels, increased parathyroid hormone means increased 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. And so this is something that is a nuance and can actually help uh, in interpretation of data by putting it into a context. So there could be reason for getting both the 25 and the 125 at the same time. Now, but in most cases, um, if you see a low 125, and a low PTH in the setting of a hypercalcemia, um, then it rules out the two most common causes, the PTH and the 125 high dihydroxy as being the causal uh, uh, you know, kind of trigger or driver of the uh, hypercalcemia. And it can be been really important for analysis. So the context is most times we want to take a look at the 125 is in the case of hypercalcemia. So let's set this in kind of a, a, a familiar situation. Here we have a 58 year old coming to the emergency room. He's got a week of confusion, disorientation, uh, polyuria, polydipsia. Differential diagnosis is quite broad. Does he have diabetes? Does he have, what is going on here? In this case, he's tachycardic. He's got ultramental altered mental status, he has dehydration. Um, in this case, instead of having high blood sugars, he's got a high white count, he's got a high platelet count, and his calcium level is sky high off the roof. Okay, it's not diabetes, what is it? Well, in this case, then you're gonna be thinking about, okay, what are the causes for hypercalcemia? And that's why I really want you to know about the differential diagnosis, what you need to be thinking, what you, as, as you think through it, then you know exactly what are the tests that you need to order. And so for inpatient hypercalcemia, which include ER visits, uh, we have to think malignancy, malignancy, malignancy. So in a person like this, you wanna get a, a past medical history becomes very important. Um, but the differential diagnosis um, can include uh, uh, unrecognized uh, multiple myeloma from before. You can have uh, a primary hyperparathyroidism. Um, you can have uh, elevated parathyroid hormone related protein. And so that is again, a byproduct of cancer. Um, and so it would be considered a uh, paraneoplastic phenomenon. You can have excessive supplementation of vitamin D. And you know how many people have seen people doing way too much vitamin D, uh, thinking that more is better, that is possible. And then you can have excessive 125 production. And that can include uh, you know, kind of non-solid uh, malignancies such as lymphomas. Uh, think about uh, post-transplant and the like. 
or can include a very granulomatous diseases, including sarcoid. The outpatient hypercalcemia, though, uh, primarily you have to think about hyperparathyroidism, um, primary. You can have now cases of hyperthyroidism, uh, having hypercalcemia. The vitamin D intoxication, of course, the granulomatous diseases, malignancies, acromegaly, um, growth hormone, a variety of other things that relate to uh, medications or VIPomas or kind of more rare uh, things. The vast majority uh, you need to roll out uh, these uh, before going to the more, uh, uh, more esoteric areas. So how does this all play out? Let's uh, do a case study. Okay, here's a 67-year-old previously healthy guy. He comes in with, again, polyuria, unsteady gait, dizziness, confusion. The vast majority of such people are going to see are going to be diabetic. Uh, but in fact, uh, he could be diabetic, but his blood sugars are doing okay. He's in acute renal failure, though. His creatinine is up to 4.9. His GFR is quite low. And he's got this calcium at 16.3. Key point, hypercalcium levels mean hypercalciuria, mean hyper, to me, they mean polyuria. It's a frequent cause of frequent urination. His parathyroid hormone is just mm, slightly high. Um, so you give, he gets IV fluids, calcitonin, pimidronate, um, ultrasound shows a right inferior parathyroid mass. You think, ah, oh, okay, but um, we've got the answer here. He's got a primary hyperparathyroidism. So he goes and gets a parathyroid uh, resected. PTH drops from a slightly high level to a very normal level, and then creatinine normalizes. Great, and PTH remains low. And so we've got successful resolution of primary hyperparathyroidism. Yay. But the calcium remains high. What do you do now? How can you explain this? And that's when we need to think, okay, what's the differential diagnosis uh, for this? Is this a perioperative phenomenon or is there something else underlying this? Remember the, the parathyroid hormone uh, level was not all that high and that parathyroid Mass may have explained it, but it has not solved the initial problem. So we need to think about our differential diagnosis. Okay, we've already addressed primary hyperparathyroidism. Does he have hyperthyroidism? Does he get vitamin D intoxicated? Does he have a perineoplastic process? Have granulomatous, granulomatous disease, malignancy, acromegaly, something else? That's what we work through. So malignancy. The parathyroid hormone-related protein is normal. The 125 comes back sky high. Okay, actually, so we have a new issue here. He's got a very high 125 dihydroxy. Where is this coming from? Differential diagnosis for this. Sarcoid, granulomatous, granulomatous disease, malignancy, either a um, solid organ or lymphoma. Uh, a hormonal issue, uh, such a, uh, growth hormone, thyroid, um, or some, something beyond this. So how do we value, evaluate this? So assessing for granulomatous disease, assessing for bone mets, consider this, we'll come back to this at the very end of the program about evaluation of potential bone mets. No signs of growth hormone excess. Got to look for malignancy. So and that's part of where the differential diagnosis comes in. So, so gee, we're missing some slides here. So, okay, well, the case is that he actually uh, ended up getting a PET scan. He got scanned for uh, his spleen lit up um, and uh, the diagnosis was he actually had a large B cell lymphoma in his spleen. Um, that produced the one alpha hydroxyl hydroxylase. Um, and so recall it's the one alpha hydroxylase, uh, which is the activating um, enzyme found primarily in the kidney, but that can be found throughout the body. And so therefore it was in a, this uh, uh, was uh, unrestricted uh, production and uncontrolled production of the 125 dihydroxyvitamin D. 
So the case is then I uh, underwent splenectomy and everything normalized. Okay, so that was uh, that was a first uh, such case. It's kind of okay. Broad differential, we can narrow it down. The use of the 125 testing was really important there um, for them really uh, focusing on where we're going to find and why we would need to pursue doing um, a PET scan uh, study. So this next case is a 65-year-old. He's vitamin D deficient. So he started on high-dose ergocalciferol, available over-the-counter, sold as vitamin D. Uh, excuse me, ergocalciferol is a prescription drug, generally 50,000 international units once or twice a week. He was on that for three months. Um, and he becomes symptomatic. Aha, is he getting too much? His calcium is 14.1. Yes, he's gonna be symptomatic with that, including polyuria and mental status changes and like. How are we gonna work this up? Well, we know the first seven cases I'm gonna present are about hypercalcemia, so here it is, uh, a hypercalcemia case. How are we gonna work this up? Again, the differential diagnosis, hyperparathyroidism, vitamin D intoxication, granulomatous disease, malignancies, uh, acromegaly being the tops of the list. So, and this is the ordering that we would do. Uh, we would add maybe a TSH in here as well, depending on what else you would uh, be finding. Notice that the 125 is, at, uh, is after a series of tests. Maybe you'd order these all at the same time, depending on the clinical situation. So his PTH came back normal. His vitamin D came back normal, so it's not an intoxication issue. His parathyroid hormone-related protein came back normal. And his 125 is elevated. Okay, now we have to think about why is this going to be the case? So let's go hunting for malignancies. Chest X-ray, CT or negative. ACE is suggestive, and that's the angiotensin converting enzyme uh, test which can be elevated in sarcoid. But what next here? So treat him with prednisone for presumptive uh, sarcoid. And he gets better. The 125 normalizes. But it goes back up after prednisone uh, is stopped. Um, and uh, OK, so here's our case. Here's our slide with the, with the PET CT. We had intense splenic uptake um, with uh, this. He underwent splenectomy, so similar to the case before. And uh, in this case, though, it's not a malignancy like the large uh, B cell lymph uh, lymphoma that we saw in the spleen. In this case, it is sarcoid in the spleen. And so the treatment of splenectomy, things will resolve. So let's just uh, stop here kind of halfway uh, through is that, yes, you treat with pre uh, prednisone presumptively, things normalize, but you monitor with the 125 and you can get a recurrence after the prednisone is discontinued because you're monitoring and you don't want someone on prednisone all the time. And you know there's too many downsides to that. Um, so that's when you go hunting, you find the malignants or the um, sarcoid the, um, or the granulopathous disease, and that's what you address. So these are two kind of common cases. The third, this next case, chronic uh, kidney disease, end-stage renal disease, is again, is another time we're gonna see this a lot. Here's an 81-year-old gentleman. He's got uh, chronic renal failure due to diabetes. He's been on dialysis for six years, but he's got progressive hypercalcemia. So with that, then you're going to discontinue the prescription calcitriol, thinking that you're, he's getting too much. Um, and, uh, but um, he's got fatigue, he's got anorexia, insomnia, he's, his exam is normal, he's got normal routine labs. Um, what now? So we have to go back to, again, uh, primary, or in this case, uh, kind of tertiary hyperparathyroidism, vitamin D intoxication, Increased 125 from granulomatous disease, malignancy, acromegaly. Yes, I want you to really know this differential diagnosis um, by the end of the presentation. So let's go through it. Parathyroid hormone is normal. Vitamin D is normal. He, his related protein is normal. Um, the 125 is 
Yeah, high end of normal, uh, but normal. Chest X-rays normal. His angiotensin converting enzyme in, uh, level is borderline. Um, what now? What's ex what's going to explain this progressive hypercalcemia? And what's the most cost-effective route to evaluating it? Well, based on the laboratory results for the calcium and the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D test, we've got to consider sarcoid, granulomatous, granulomatous disease like TB or histo, uh, lymphoma, and other malignancies, growth hormone excess. Um, and this is why accurate measurement is so important. Notice the level 55 was in kind of the normal range, but what is the range of variation among this? Uh, so you don't want something that's going to be wildly inaccurate. Uh, this, is some, this is a time where you really are going to want to have uh, rigor and passing get an accurate uh, measurement here. So uh, because you know we can spend you know, uh, $5,000 on a PET scan, we can do all kinds of, uh, we can do a variety of things which are invasive, uh, expensive, uh, we might not get the answer. In this case, um, the clinical suspicion was such that we need to do a skin biopsy, and so it's a non-casein granuloma, a non multinucleated giant cells. Okay, we've got another case of, uh, of granulomatous-related uh, disease uh, causing hypercalcemia. That can be addressed. Okay, and we treat with prednisone. And what's the question? Um, and so it can, for a brief time, monitor symptoms, the physical exam, the calcium levels. Um, have to be careful about the use of vitamin D itself. Um, and we've got to monitor the 125. Again, good reason why measuring at the same time of the day and using um, you know superb, uh, superbly rigorous uh, uh, testing capacity is going to give you um, excellent clinical guidance in this. So in any case, uh, so it's, he was able to go 16 months uh, without prednisone and uh, with monitoring. And uh, so it's a kind of a case of zero monitoring can be so helpful. All right, how about, uh, does that ever affect women? Of course, yes. Here's a 50 year old with hypercalcemia. Um, she got normal 25, normal PTH, actually it's fairly, kind of unremarkably, uh, but kind of low normal PTH, uh, late proteins undetectable, but the 125 is really quite high. And so, uh, so let's uh, think about how we want to think about this. So that's where we want to think about expanding the differential diagnosis, and so that's where we go into measuring other hormonal levels, like the IGF-1, and like growth hormone, and so in fact, Behind her story is a pituitary tumor. And so, um, so this is a case of unrecognized acromegaly and, uh, and for which treatment uh, would be um, the transferenoidal adenoidectomy. And, uh, and then you can monitor um, afterwards. And in fact, in this case, her 125 did normalize and she's doing well. Now, as you can imagine, Sometimes there are incomplete receptions, and again, that would be an indication for following the 125 in a serial manner over time, or following calcium uh, over time. All right, case five is another woman, uh, woman with uh, uh, high uh, calcium. Her PTH is also low. Her vitamin D is also in normal range. Her related protein is normal, and the 125 is high normal but not outrageously, um, but she's got some visual field cuts. Hmm, how are you going to approach this? Well, again, thinking about uh, what well, from the last case, IGF and growth hormone um, uh, are an important level, important follow-up test uh, um, for, again, unrecognized acromegaly. And in this case, so the MRI did show another pituitary malign um, Neoplasm. Um, so again, you can uh, treat that with transferenoid adenoidectomy. So the calcium um, uh, postoperatively um, is to remain a little bit high. The IGF 
one is really high, the growth hormone is down, but still high, the 125 is still high. Okay, so there's some very important clinical data then, and uh, you recognize that mm, it was definitely an incomplete resection. This is therefore, uh, and this is kind of consultation with neurosurgical colleagues about next, uh, next steps and uh, for monitoring. All right, case six, kidney stones. We all see folks with kidney stones and, uh, and one of their most common things, one of those severe causes of pain. Um, so how might this evaluation be helpful? So here's kind of a, a nice example. Here's a 24 year old. He's had kidney stones for the past six years. He's got significant hypercalciuria. He's got hypercalcemia, but he's got a low PTH as would be expected. He's got a normal vitamin D and he's got a high 125. How are you going to make sense of this? Let's go through a differential diagnosis for the hypercalcemia. You know, it's kind of, okay, we're going to rule out PTH, rule out TSH, rule out uh, things. So is this a case of malignancy? Is this a, uh, over the past six years? Is there, or is something else going on? Is this a case of uh, pituitary issues? Or is there something else going on? So. Um, we've talked about granulomatous disease, we've talked about sarcoid, and, um, and we mentioned TB and histo, we've covered a couple cases of malignancies, covered a couple cases of acromegaly. What else might explain this increase 125? And that is actually, this is a case of reduced functioning of the CYP24A1. And this can be due to heterozygous or homozygous single nucle nucleotide polymorphisms or other variations um, in the gene for CYP24A1. It's been reported in cases, uh, this case is from 2014, but in January 2017, a nice article um, uh, by Carpenter, uh, uh, it's really describing how that there's actually a lot uh, of cases now of reduced function of CYP24A1. Why is it so important? Well, you see here that we talked about um, the 125 being required to be activated by uh, through the 27B1 from the 25. But notice that the breakdown products of both the 25 and the 125 have to go through CYP24A1. Now, if this is slow, then these levels will be high. In particular, what will count is the 125 um, being quite high uh, if this is quite slow. So I imagine in future years, we might find that there are certain medications which slow uh, CYP24A1. Certainly, uh, there are medications uh, like dexamethasone, which appear to speed up 24A1. It might also be rifampin uh, as well. Uh, so these would be things that would be of uh, importance in considering your differential diagnosis here. Okay, case seven. 57 year old, he's got left flank pain, anorexia, 23 kilos of weight loss over two months. And so, yes, you're thinking malignancy, malignancy, malignancy. CAT scan shows a large left kidney mass with retroperitoneal lymph node enlargement. Okay, it's a neoplasm malignancy. Get a biopsy. It's high grade clear uh, renal cell carcinoma. And you're playing a surgical resection but let's make sure that's not gonna be any problems. So you get some preoperative uh, evaluations. What do you find? Well, he's got some nausea. He's got a mild hyponatremia. His blood sugar is slightly high and he's hypercalcemic with a low albumin. Huh, where are you gonna take this, the next step? What's your, what's your assessment? What's your plan? So what's the differential diagnosis? Going through this again, okay, going through the sequence, uh, considering each of these steps that uh, we've talked about. So, PKH is low, 25D is normal, the related protein is normal, the 125 is high, pretty significantly high. Okay, so 
Treat with fluids, let's take care of, uh, do what we can to bring the calcium down. Um, get, you know, ideally, we'll get the, uh, we'll avoid um, significant uh, problems by monitoring interoperatively. And we find that uh, postoperatively, his 125 is down to 24 um, with the calcium uh, being normalized for his albumin. So with pathology, what's interesting here is the pathology showed a high-grade carcinoma. Um, and, um, and so we can presume that resection of this made a difference. And the kind of key take-home point here is that there are actually a lot of cases in the literature of malignancy associated with hypercalcemia with a suppressed PTH and a normal related protein. So there's more to the story uh, here in creating the 125. So excuse me as I cough. <coughs> okay, so uh, in the first seven cases here, we've talked about hypercalcemia and the differential diagnosis um, and the many different ways it can present and you can see where the 125 is actually playing a very important role in supporting your capacity to um, advocate and, and both diagnose and treat uh, your patient. Now, case eight is gonna be a little bit different. Now, we're gonna um, change things a bit. Now, Rick says in the picture here, you think about being low vitamin D um, uh, state. They talk about you know, people who don't get out in the sun, uh, don't have, uh, any intake of vitamin D from any source. In this case, it's a 25-year-old uh, girl, disproportionate growth. She's got perspiration, constipation, deformed extremities, walking difficulties, partial alopecia, convulsions, bone pain, weak muscles. She's got rickets, but some, that sounds like there's a lot more going on. <coughs> so, of course, we're gonna get a 25 vitamin D level on her. That's what we're thinking, but what else is an exam? It's got an open fontanelle for the forehead here. Uh, at her age, it's a little bit unusual. Her cranial sutures are normal, mild frontal bossing, patchy distribution of hair, widened distal metaphysis of the radius and on the double joints. Sounding like rickets, rickets, rickets. Widened distal metaphysis of the fibula. And if you got the letter X sign below, is this rickets still proven otherwise? But vitamin D is normal. Huh. So what do we do now? Well, how's her calcium? Oh, it's really quite low. So this is a case of hypocalcemia. And it's a game appropriate response is hypocalcemia. Yes, her PTH is elevated. So it, the body is responding to try to get uh, to maintain normal calcium levels, so calcium uh, homeostasis. So you've got a hypocalcemic bone problem in a 25-year-old girl, or 25-month-old girl. So you want to look at the bones. Alphas is quite high, and the 125 is quite high. How do we make sense of this? Well, first thing is you're just going to... Uh, say that you know this kind of this is a case of vitamin D resistant uh, rickets and then everything we see is a compensatory reaction to that. So we actually want to give calcium intravenously because it's not going to be it's not going to be enough that's going to be uh, absorbed through uh, the intestinal lining. And we're going to want to give activated vitamin D um, uh, in this and with this, we can uh, see that the alkafos levels are normalized, the bone pain resolved, strength is increased, parathyroid hormone is normalized. So and before we go into case nine, it just kind of say that, oh, yes, in the unexpected uh, cases of hypocalcemia, the 125 becomes an important guide to understanding uh, uh, the, uh, the context and for guiding you in your diagnosis and it can guide you in your treatment. If you're using 20 high dose calcitriol in a child or for an adult for that matter, um, consider also sequentially testing the 125 levels to make sure 
that you're not going excessively uh, high. Calcium will also be a measure of that, but you're giving intravenous calcium, so you really need more of a complete picture for monitoring. All right, case nine, osteoporosis. You know, such a common issue, um, and it just uh, it's so surprising that the Surgeon General, well, maybe it's not surprising, that the uh, Surgeon General and, uh, recently, um, you know, uh, has stated uh, that, you know, osteoporosis threatens every American, and one of the things that we can do in our own uh, to optimize our own health and minimize our risk is to make sure that we've got good vitamin D levels. And of course, that, you know, there's no physical exam for that, and so uh, measurement of vitamin D is so important. And obviously, when someone does have osteoporosis, it becomes even more important to measure uh, vitamin D. So this is a 55-year-old male, so someone you wouldn't necessarily expect to see with osteoporosis unless there's something else going on. He's in a, uh, he's got a DEXA scan. His T-score is quite low. It's not, this is not borderline osteoporosis with a T-score of minus 2.5, but minus 3.5 is, as you know, pretty significant. He's got ongoing fractures despite this phosphonate treatment. He's got fatigue, weakness, weight loss, falls, history of chronic sinusitis. There is more to this, to this picture. This is not your run-of-the-mill osteoporosis. So how do we approach this? How do we evaluate this bone disease? Well, calcium, of course, we're going to get, and that's normal. 25 vitamin D, that's normal. Okay, PTH, that's normal. Creatinine, that's normal. Alphas is elevated. Okay, something's going on. Phosphate is low. Okay, that's a big clue. And then 125 is low. So here we have a case of significant bone disease with a normal calcemia, but low phosphate and low 125. What's going on here? So, hypophosphatemia is not reserved for um, people who have been profoundly uh, malnourished. Um, it has a great deal to do with uh, other people as well. So, um, but in any case, when evaluating hypophosphatemia, you would expect to see an increase in the 125. In this case, you had a decrease in 125. Second point is that um, if you've got a hypophosphatemia with low 125, there can only really be one cause for this, and that is aberrant production of FGF23, the fibrinogen growth factor. And we'll show you where that comes in in just a second here. Third thing is excess production of FGF23 is due to actually a rare inherited condition or occult tumors. Now, because FGF23 has only recently been measurable, there's probably a lot more to the story. Uh, but at this uh, case, uh, this time, um, uh, it's reasonable to con uh, to consider in the workup for hypophosphatemia. Now, what is it? It's an essential regulator of phosphate homeostasis. Uh, it has its own receptor and a co-receptor, and it inhibits reabsorption of phosphate from the urine. So therefore, you're spilling phosphate in the urine, uh, hyperphosphaturia, and a relative hypophosphatemia and because of the feedback loops, it's going to decrease production of the 125, and therefore you're not going to have activated vitamin D. And so, um, so hypophosphatemia would be part of this whole picture. Now, again, here is the story. Notice that FDF 23 is in the lower right-hand corner. The 125 levels should upregulate it, and it in turn should downregulate uh, production of the 125. But in fact, if it is independently, um, uh, if there are independently excessive production or high levels of this, it will automatically uh, 
downregulate the production of 125. And notice this at the top of the screen, upregulate the breakdown of vitamin D. And so, in fact, you, this is someone who would have low vitamin D levels uh, despite um, over-the-counter or even prescription dosing of, uh, of uh, cholecalciferol or ergocalciferol. So in this case, so he gets started on phosphate and calcitriol and you go scanning for tumors and lo and behold, this chronic sinusitis issue is actually he's got um, a malignancy uh, causing this problem. So undergoes resection, phosphate and then 125 normalize, pain resolves, ambulation normalizes, his DEXA scan goes from a minus 3.5 to a minus 1.7, so his osteoporosis resolves. It's completely reversed. Um, and uh, here's a citation uh, for the case. So um, what do I want you to know? Um, I want you to know that 125 is the activated form of vitamin D. 25 is the, the 25 vitamin D is the best measure for whole body status, but 125 is the best measure for the activation. And you've got to measure 125 in hypercalcemia evaluations, and you need to consider it an evaluation of hypocalcemia evaluations. And as we just showed, hypophosphatemia would be reasonable as well. Now, differential diagnosis, I'm you know, kind of, kind of repeat, 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 but this is, you know, we need to consider metastatic cancer, osteolytic lesions, multiple myeloma, uh, parathyroidism, parathyroid-related uh, protein from malignancy, excessive vitamin D, excessive uh, production, again, malignancy, or uh, solid organ or lymphoma, prolonged immobilization could also cause this as well. An outpatient, we think about hyperparathyroidism, hyperthyroidism, uh, the vitamin D intoxication, perineoplastic, granulomatous disease, malignancies, acromegaly, and very rare others. Now, how is this used and why is this important? One, one is diagnosis of the cause of hyper or hypocalcemia. Uh, two is monitoring of calcitriol therapy. Uh, and monitoring calcitriol status with administration of oral vitamin D as cholecalciferol or ergocalciferol um, in supplementation where vitamin D appears to play a role in regulation uh, and, uh, of so many key things in the body, uh, sarcoid, um, other granulomatous disease. So for example, remember that uh, TB is, uh, is, was actually treated for many years by exposure to sunshine. In fact, vitamin D plays an incredibly important role in macrophage uh, activity and anti-vitamin D activity. But we're also kind of, uh, when I use this as measuring for, maybe for people with kidney stone issues, uh, uh, I think that's gonna be more important in the future. Now there's one additional clinical value. We start out in the, in the beginning, we talked about kind of the issue of there being osteolytic lesions with metastatic cancer causing a hypercalcemia. And I just point out a very important nuance um, in evaluating uh, people with a history of cancer. And this comes from a very interesting case study um, presented uh, in, the, in the BMJ. And that is a woman with a history of breast cancer presented with uh, widely diffuse uh, musculoskeletal pain, um, weakness, fatigue, uh, a variety of uh, symptoms. Um, with the suspicion of recurrent breast cancer, she got a bone scan and it looked, uh, as you can see here, it looks pretty darn suspicious for, for cancer. And, um, and so part of the whole, the whole thing is, a, is that evaluation for her uh, will be, uh, this particular condition will vary around the world. As I understand it, in the U.S., we would do a biopsy of one of these lesions to document whether it's cancer. 
In this case, the patient was in the UK and biopsies are not, are not routinely done. So in this case, then it would be really important then to, uh, and that was a key teaching point, is to get a measurement of a 25 hydroxy D and a measure of a 125 dihydroxy D, or maybe a parathyroid hormone related protein, really looking at um, widely metastatic cancer. In this case, and this is really important to know, this patient simply had vitamin D deficiency and, uh, and had and their dex this, um, uh, this bone scan, the lesions found here were strictly a matter of vitamin D deficiency and simply replacing vitamin D in the bone scan completely normalizes. So, so I wanna say um, thank you uh, for your attention. Thank you for your interest in vitamin D and in the assessment of hypercalcemia, hypocalcemia, and other situations where ordering the 125 can be actually really helpful in your clinical practice and your capacity to serve your patients. Um, with that being said, I mean, we've got a couple minutes for questions, um, and uh, we'll open that up uh, for questions right now. Thank you for that informative presentation. Before we get to this, uh, before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q and A box which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Um, okay, so our first question today, let's just hop right on in. Um, Dr. Plotnikoff, can you explain when 25-hydroxyvitamin hydro, D and 125-dihydroxyvitamin D tests should be ordered? I know we switch over. I know we switch okay. Over. All right. So, so uh, thank you uh, for the question. Yes, this is such an important question. And <clears throat> excuse me, as I cough there. So, so the key take-home point here is that the 25-hydroxy test is strictly for measurement of. Excuse me. <coughs> I never cough. Why am I coughing? <laughs> so, excuse me. The 25-hydroxy vitamin D is great for vitamin D status. And that should be the test that or we should be getting on everyone in the population. You know, it's kind of, it is a best measurement. Now, the 125, though, is really limited to the cases that are, are kind of really significantly unusual situations. That is the workup for hypercalcemia, the workup for hypo, certain types of hypocalcemia, um, and in the cases we present here included the workup for, say, um, uh, unusual case of osteoporosis, uh, hypophosphatemia, and the like. By far and away, uh, about 100 to, to 1 uh, physicians, uh, clinicians should be ordering the 25 hydroxy. And the 125 is really restricted to um, unusual situations for which there are uh, clear indications. Um, rather than for um, uh, everyday screening purposes. Uh, thank you for this water. Uh, so the second question. Thank you for that. Uh, the second question asks, what are the most common uh, diagnoses that are aided by abnormal 125 vitamin D levels? Great, well, thank you for this question. Um, and that's why I really want to kind of emphasize the differential diagnosis for, um, for hypercalcemia. Um, and that's where we went through with the hyperparathyroidism, uh, hyperthyroidism. Uh, we talked about different types of malignancies, uh, the parathyroid hormone-related protein. We talked about um, um, acromegaly, we talked about granulomatous disease, which includes sarcoid, histoplasmosis, um, uh, and the like. And um, 
Um, and uh, so the um, so I, I want you to kind of since it's all going to be online, I really like to uh, since you asked this question, I really would like you to kind of really go back and review uh, what uh, uh, the the slides. And so if uh, kind of the great value in a webinar like this is you know, supporting your capacity to create a good differential diagnosis um, and then be able to think through the case. But hypercalcemia, hypocalcemia, and then uh, relate unusual things such as the osteoporosis, the kidney stones, and the like. So uh, I see we're about at one hour right now. Um, is there another pressing question? Yes, we are almost out of time, so we'll do one last question and then we'll go into a close. Um, how do physicians distinguish between rickets from hereditary rickets? Well, great uh, question about rickets. Rickets are really important to know about because, in fact, actually, we're seeing more and more rickets. But the, the, but the increased... Uh, Incidence and prevalence of rickets is really due to 25 uh, vitamin D deficiency. Now, what's interesting is you recall rickets may have been Tiny Tim in, uh, in, uh, by uh, Dickens and uh, Scrooge. Um, rickets has been, we think about as kind of being in the past, we think about cities in which there is no sunlight, there's too much smog overhead. Um, but in fact, actually, we uh, though we think about rickets as being kind of in the past, it's actually more and more in the present. We live, we work long hours indoors. Um, we enjoy air conditioning. Um, uh, we live in cities where there's so much smog overhead that the ultraviolet B rates, uh, B rays, which are needed for production of vitamin D with uh, when you contact our skin, just are not present. So. In fact, we're seeing um, acquired rickets uh, uh, in kind of uh, so shockingly increasing numbers. And it needs to be part of the differential diagnosis uh, um, for all children. In fact, um, uh, we need to also consider that uh, we don't want women going through pregnancy vitamin D deficient. Um, and so ensuring a good vitamin D level, minimum of 20 nanograms per ml, is going to be really important. And, and nearly everyone in this planet is at risk. Now, here in Minneapolis, I'm at 45 degrees north. I'm halfway to the North Pole, and I can only make vitamin D between April 15th, roughly, and uh, I think tax day and Labor Day. Um, and uh, if I'm out in the sun between 10 and 3, and there's no smog overhead, and there's I got a shadow on the ground, um, and I'm not wearing sunscreen, particularly if I'm not wearing clothing, I'm going to make some vitamin D. But anytime that my shadow is longer than I am tall, I cannot make vitamin D, and that's most of the year here in Minnesota. So that's what we need to worry about. The congenital uh, um, vitamin uh, rickets they talk about is really a dysfunction in the uh, whole a calcium homeostatic uh, regulatory system. So we talked about the one case here um, of where uh, there's uh, disruption in this. And that's why it's really important for, to not stop it saying, oh, this patient has a normal vitamin D level, therefore it cannot be rickets. You have to take it to the next step if you're suspecting rickets. And we all need to be suspecting rickets as pediatricians. Um, and so that would require getting the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D. So knowledge of both tests are really important. And so that's why I'm so glad you, you stayed with this uh, webinar today. I really I wish you best uh, luck with your practice and, uh, that you, and that I'm hoping that you find something today that, that will lead you to um, to be able to serve your patients uh, well into the future. And I look forward to any additional questions. Um, you can always reach me through my website or through Lab Roots. And so I thank you very much for your time and attention today. Uh, take care.
I would like to once again thank Gregory Plotnikoff for his presentation. Um, in closing, do you have any final comments? Oh, any final comments? Well, um, <laughs> I think I've said a lot today. I'm really concerned. I want to make sure that if you have any questions or concerns, you can contact me through uh, through the website um, uh, through the website for my clinic or contact Lab Roots. Uh, and I look forward to being helpful. Um, so if I can be helpful, please let me know. Thank you. I would also like to thank our sponsor, Dia Soren, for making today's educational webcast possible. Today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through November 2017. You will receive an email from LabRoots alerting you when this webcast will be available for replay. We invite you to forward that announcement to your colleagues who may have missed today's presentation. Once again, thank you, and we will see you next time here at LabRoots. Goodbye.